Hi, welcome to Shoreline Conversations, episode 15. I'm Thomas, I produce this podcast, and we're doing it remotely today because of some new California guidelines. We didn't want to be uh, in, a, in a, a small studio without masks, and uh, podcasts are always better uh, without masks. Uh, I, not that I, We haven't tried it with masks yet, so we can't say that for sure, but I imagine podcasting is better uh, without wearing masks. So. We are, uh, we got Dennis here. We're back with another episode on tactics and we're gonna dig in to the uh, tactics themselves today. The first episode, Cole and Dennis talked about just kind of the general idea of tactics, kind of set the stage for us to go into the specific tactics. So uh, Dennis is here with us. Dennis, how you doing? I'm doing well and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in agreement that we do it, this podcast this way. I think we gotta be smart. This is a this is a difficult time, and we need to be on the front edge of doing the right thing. So I appreciate you setting all this up. Indeed. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, being a part of this, as always. And uh, today we are going to go through our first tactic. Now, the first uh, official tactic in in the book is called the Colombo tactic. So. Um, can you give us a brief overview of, of that tactic? What is the Colombo tactic? Kind of a goofy name. Well, I can, and I have a unique perspective. Um, of course, I read uh, Greg Kokel's book, his workbook, watched the videos. But I also watched all the Colombo series when they were first on TV. Peter Falk, the bumbling uh, lieutenant a detective with the brown overcoat that was always rumpled with a stub of a cigar, a little notepad in his pocket, but he never could find a pencil. And he had this humble, self-effacing way of conducting his initial interrogations in an investigation that was disarming. And people would initially, I mean, show by show, initially, Uh, People would see him as, ah, this bumbling fool of a detective. What an idiot. And he'd let him take that position because he knew exactly what he was doing. And he would say, you you know, do you you mind if I ask you a few questions? Could I ask you some questions? And uh, they'd say, sure. And he'd go, okay. And he'd ask questions, get answers and say, you know, you're, you're really smart. I appreciate that. You you articulate this well, so thank you very much. Um, I'm going to make a few notes here. I got this pad here, and oh, man, I don't have a – you got a pencil or something? I'm sorry. I'm always forgetting my pencil. And then you get the pencil and say, now, what was that thing again? Let me write this down. Okay, thank you very much. You, you gave me what I needed. Oh, uh, one more thing. Gosh, you, just, you know, I know I ask a lot of questions. My wife said it's annoying. I can't help it. It's just me being who I am. And sure enough, as you're watching the show, part way and you start to feel the, uh, the, the noose tighten around <laughs> the criminal, the perpetrator. And, and every once in a while, you give him a look in the eye. And he'd ask a couple more questions. They'd look him in the eye and a camera would pan in on Columbo's eyes and you'd see it. He knew exactly what he was doing. So Greg Kokel has taken this approach because it's disarming. It doesn't inspire defenses initially. It offers respect and gentleness, but soon into the process, you find that it's also relentless and it's going somewhere. Mm -hmm. So he seized on this. And I got to tell you, I many years ago in my counseling practice in the Bay Area, I would tell people about Columbo. I'd say, you know, why don't you just use this sort of that Columbo thing where you ask them questions and get more information, and then they kind of paint themselves in a corner and you're not the bad guy. So when I came across this uh, work by Kokel and he calls it the Columbo tactic, I'm like, whoa. That's great. I wish I'd have thought of it first. Well, there you but go. It's fate. It was meant. You guys were meant to be. Apparently so. We're partners, sort of. Indeed. Well, why is that? Why is that so effective? Because I feel like, especially, uh, probably not especially today. I, I'm sure it's been like this for 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 all time. But uh, when you have conversations about beliefs, it seems like uh, 
both sides making a lot of assertions, a lot of statements at each other, a lot of statements of belief. And then you might have somebody rattle off uh, five different beliefs and then the response is so much gets lost in just these statements going at each other. Why is it so effective to uh, kind of, I mean, play dumb is a, is is maybe a oversimplifying it. It's not quite playing dumb, but it's kind of playing me. dumb. <laughs> a short trip for me. <laughs> Uh-oh. Self-deprecation. My, my, my. Um <laughs> Why is that so effective? Why why is that so and, and also uh kind of rare. You don't see this a lot. And I haven't experienced it a lot in these kind of conversations. Well, that's a great question because there are very sound reasons why it's so effective. One is, you know, the majority of people aren't asked what they think about things with any depth at all. People throw opinions out all the time. But how many times has someone actually asked and, and think about your own experience, Thomas, and any of the uh, people who view this podcast or listen to it. Think about those people in your life or those instances in your life where somebody looked at you, expressed interest, and asked your view on things. That alone is honoring, respectful, and engaging. Then the other thing that happens is, is, is if they answer. You know, you ask a question, and we'll go through those three steps in Colombo, and, and, and they answer. What you're helping them do, they don't know right away, but you'll notice right away. They will take a moment and get a little clearer as they answer the question. And if they don't, it's an assertion. It's not an argument. It has no support. You don't have to tinker with it. But then next, not only do you get to see more of the reason they think the way they do, or, or you're more clear on what they exa- mean, I would say, step one on what they mean, but also they get to get more clear themselves. But it's a very honest act of respect, um, and you look right at them, and you ask them the question, and you pause, and you wait for them to answer. This question is not a rhetorical device to hold ground so that you can launch your salvo against them. And that's critical in this. If somebody doesn't have a sincere heart and really want to know what this person's thinking, they'll sense it. Mm. And most people have never been asked that. What do you really think? I'm interested in what you think. Tell me. I want to know. That alone is engaging to start with. That's uh, that's powerful. And I'm glad you mentioned that because um, sort of a critique I have against the book um, is that sometimes Kugel comes across as um, th- that this is a debate. It's very, I mean, tactical, uh, right? Uh, that's, the book is tactics. So, yeah. um, And he does mention this. He does go over this. I think he is aware. But sometimes as you read, you can get the idea that you're not having a genuine conversation. You're just you're out kind of manipulating the conversation and you're, you know, you're playing chess and they're playing checkers kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm glad you mentioned the the honoring, it's honoring, respectful and engaging, you said, and, and approaching conversations with that kind of heart. Um, not that we can't utilize these tactics. And I really don't think uh, Kukul would disagree with this. I think sometimes it's just tone is tough in writing. Um, yeah. uh, why, why is it... Um, why is it dangerous sometimes to uh, to get the, to to miss that balance? Um, and I've been guilty of this more often than not. I actually love debating any topic. Uh, I I just I have fun. I have genuine. I get genuine joy. If I was to take like a road trip with somebody, I'd rather take it with somebody that I disagree with on like everything than somebody that I I'm like like minded with. It'd be so boring. Uh, uh, yeah. So I can really easily fall into not being honoring and engaging, but viewing this as like a game, a conversation like a game. Uh, yeah. uh, how do we, I, I can't remember what my question was, but it, it, it's, it's why is that so dangerous and how do we avoid that? And how do we be genuine in these conversations when we're using well, tactics I, I like, like this? the picture you painted, Thomas, about you could take a road trip and you want it with somebody you disagree with on everything. But you know what? Um, that's unique, and that's in a definite minority. Right. Um, I've noticed. <laughs> <laughs> but we love you for it. 
I think I think uh, the honoring and respecting comment I made a moment ago, if we want to know why it's so helpful and why it's so important to do this, flip it over. If, if the main goal is I've got to get them to the place I need them to be, and that's the only goal. My job here is to get them where I need them to be. Then I would be at risk of affecting care, uh, of pretending engagement. You know, that sort of thing where almost like, no offense to anybody, it's sort of a used car, sa car salesman stereotype. Yeah, you're amazing. Hey, you're a smart guy. Boy, you're good looking. I love your outfit. Hey, mm -hmm. sign here. What's it going to take? And it can almost get that sort of flavor to it because the opposite of respect is disrespect. People could sense it. So, so you don't even really want to know me. You just have somewhere you want to get me to be. I just made a poem. I didn't even try to do wow. that. Wow, you're talented. Yeah. That's going to be on a coffee cup. Mark my words. <laughs> All right. I want 10%. I'll buy it. I'll buy it. <laughs> I'll have my grandkids make them up. Beautiful. Anyway, but the idea is, if you don't really care about people, you just really care about your agenda and getting them where you want them to be, I would say back away from this. Maybe don't, because you could do more harm than good. But you know, how hard is it to care about people? If, if we stop for a moment and think, every person I talk to is a Mago Dei. They're created in the image of God. Now, whether they acknowledge it or not, Ephesians 2.10 applies to them. They are a workmanship, a handiwork, a masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for them to do. I mean, they, they either are or they're not. And I know that they are. So the second question in Colombo is probably even more important if you really want to get to know somebody. So I ask them, what do you mean by that? And the second question is, how did you get there? What, where did that view come from? What, how did you come to those conclusions? What am I saying if I'm sincere? I want to know your journey because your journey is about you. Your journey is about you. And so if people begin to sense that you want to know about their journey and you're really interested in the journey, by the second step of the Colombo tactic, tactic two, it's going to be unmistakable that you're interested in them as a person. Indeed. I, I would think. I, I, I absolutely agree. And and let's let's go over that real quick just to be clear. So the Colombo tactic kind of has three sub-tactics. Um, it's all about asking the right questions. You mentioned there's a, there's a first and a second. So explain to me what the first question is um, and yeah. kind of the intro question into this Colombo tactic. What should the your first, first question, question be? And I would say with the people who attended the tactics class, which all of those are available on our website, that first question is the one that everybody remembered. And, and even now when I run into them, bar none, it's a very simple one. The question is, what do you mean by that? I mean, this, it's so simple and so good. So if somebody um, would say to me, um, I don't believe there's any God. I mean, you know, nature takes care of everything. I, I, I can say, okay, well, tell me when you say God, what you mean, and tell me what you mean when you say nature. Mm -hmm. I'd like to learn more about it. Right. So you, that question opens a door for them. And they have to think for a moment uh, and add more words and more context to the word God in their view and the word nature in their view, or they just bail right then. Right. Uh, if they bail right then, well, then it's like, have a nice day. But most don't. So, so you ask that, what do you mean by that? What do you mean when you say? Or people say, well, there's all the evil in the world. Okay, I, yeah, yeah. So when you say evil, what are you thinking? What, 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 what's your meaning of evil? Mm-hmm. And it just slows me down, and I'm not ready to fire back my pack, prepackaged answers to everything, and I'm going to really explore, and we're going to start peeling this thing. So what do you mean by that? I can't tell you how many times I've already used it in counseling with people. Yeah. Well, he never listens to me. Well, what, when you say never, what do you mean? Do you mean really never? I mean, or, or do you have another meaning for it? 
And when you say listens, what what do you what do you think? What do you mean by that? I mean, this works all over the place. This kind of a question, what do you mean by that? And that's powerful because, uh, as Kukul says, a lot of people, I think, are afraid to engage in these kind of conversations because they're afraid they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the uh, the intellectual uh, background to defend the problem of evil or, or uh, whatever the topic of conversation is. Um, how do these conversations uh, not not bail out, but how do they how do they help the question asker? Uh, so the person getting asked the question is going to have to do some reflection. I think you're right in that it's it's rare probably that they actually have somebody that wants you to elaborate. Um, but also the question asker, you as the asker asking those kind of questions and being able to sit back and and listen to them process through. How does it help you? Uh, especially if you may not be completely confident in your uh, background of knowledge in, in the way this topic is going or this conversation that you're having. That's important. You're right. That's a great point because many people who, who uh, want to use this question uh, may not have done extensive study on all the various responses to questions doubters or skeptics ask. So the question has to be very useful and available to any user at any level. So what, what it makes me do as I listen, I ask the question, then I listen, <clears throat> excuse me, it makes me a better listener. I have to pay attention because I've opened the engagement. I've opened it with the question. I could have just brushed off an assertion, said, oh, I'll ask just what you think. See you later. Let's get a sandwich. I could have brushed it off, but I didn't. So I've taken a step toward the person. Now I have to pay attention. I have to attend to them and listen. Otherwise, I'm going to blow it on my end. If I don't grasp what they're saying somehow and just let it be put out in front of us, or as I learned when I work uh, worked with uh, Navajo uh, and Hopi tribes, the basket that you put things in, if I don't, if I don't put it in my basket as they share it, then I'm not doing my job. I, I'm not. I, I need to get out of the process. So it makes me attentive and a listener. And then on their end, when they see someone attending to and listening, that's when the possibility that they're cared about enters in. And one of the jobs of any evangelist or any evangelistic effort is to somehow have the care and love of Jesus enter in. Beautiful, and so that uh, you you've really you really set the stage, you set the tone in a conversation. I feel like there's a lot of uh, uh, a tension that can be relieved just with that one question, making them feel that way. Um, also, giving you the time to really receive what they're saying and, and process through it. So they answer that first question. What do you mean by that? And um, that could go a number of different ways. Like you said, that could be the end of the, that could be a quick end of the conversation when they realize maybe they haven't thought this through, which is totally fine. Uh, I'm sure we've all experienced that at some point in our lives as well. It's nothing, yeah. uh, nothing extraordinary there. But say they do, um, they do have some, they have put some thought in this. They do have some answers and they give you uh, where they come from, what they mean by uh, what they said. What's the next question? What's the next step? How do we navigate that? Well, the very next question is asked after you feed back to them what their view is. So you've asked, what do you mean by that? And they've told you. And, and now you may be moving from an assertion to an argument. They may be moving to an argument. They may have shared what they mean by that in a way that you get an indication, that, oh, they've done some thinking. They've got some pieces to the puzzle here. They may do that, but you're going to learn right away whether it's an assertion or may continue on to be an argument. An assertion being something people just say because anybody can say anything. Mm -hmm. Then the very next question, so, so that establishes that you're right, Thomas. That establishes that you're interested, you're engaged, and, and say they've laid their view. Then I feed it back and say, so, so I want to make sure I have you right. This is how, that's how I word it. Let me make sure I got this. You're saying X, Y, and Z, and P and Q and L, right? Yeah, great. Okay, so, so that's your view. Great. Now, they got validated 
But I also lingered a moment because I'm going to refer back to that at some point. That's literally like a drawing they made and put on the table. It's their drawing. Mm -hmm. It's sitting there. It can't be taken off the table. So I linger a little bit there. Then my next question is, okay, so I got your view right. Yeah. How did you get there? How did you come to that conclusion? Can you tell me how did you think of it? How did it come about? Some form or another, but the same thing is, I want to know how you got to the view you just laid on the table. Beautiful. And if they've laid the view on the table, there's a good chance, and they haven't bailed, there's a good chance they'll tell you some stuff. I don't know what it will be, but they'll tell you some things about how they got there. So again, you're interested in them. It's unmistakable. And you may learn some important clues to understanding their view and understanding them as a person. I mean, I remember one time talking to somebody doing something like this, and they said, well, I don't, you know, this is what I think about all of it, because, you know, after all that junk my parents put me through at such and such church, I went, aha, mm. now I'm seeing an important part of the journey. I'm going to file that away, and if there's a respectful way to dig into their journey in those painful places, I'm going to take that opportunity later, but I got some valuable information and they had an opportunity to describe their journey and I let them I'm listening again and and what I might say along the way as they share their journey I might say so so this happened there what else happened there you ask questions it's called questions to discover beautiful uh, Coco doesn't say that but I say it. ask more questions to learn more so they might say, and then, you know, I went through all that stuff you go through as a teen. I might say, well, I don't, I don't really know. I mean, I have mine. Tell me a little bit about yours. So you see, there's so many opportunities to ask more questions. You get the theme now, the questioning is the important thing here. So in that second question, how did you get there? I really do want to know. And I want them to hear themselves share. And then what I'll watch for, because I'm a therapist too, I'll watch and see if there's affect connections. Like when they talked about they were a Christian up until Grandma Susie passed away and they all prayed for her and she died anyway and she was the sweetest person he ever met. So after that, he couldn't believe. I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I'm so sorry that happened to you, but I'm watching to see, are they emotionally connected to that? Mm -hmm. The odds are they are. I'll see it. That gives me more information so I can care for them and have more understanding about how they got to their point of view. So for me, I don't ever do it just in a straight clinical right out of the book way. Right. I'm always thinking this is a person here. Yep. You know, trying to help that person come out. And yeah, I think that's that's important a lot of times that um again, these conversations stereotypically or, or however you want to put it, they uh, can devolve into talking over each other or you're bringing up this point. I, I, it's like a fight between uh, between spouses. You know, that you end up starting the argument on one thing and you end it on something way down the road. Uh, I feel like this kind of gathering information not only is helping uh, is helping you kind of get a, get a placement in this conversation. It's helping them express their views, but it's also helping the conversation stay on topic. It's helping you talk about what you're talking about when you're mm -hmm. listening and you're, and you're taking your, like you said, you're logging away those, those bits of information. Um, and I feel like that can be really useful. I, uh, uh, that's not really a question. I just, I just thought that that's maybe a, a side effect. No, a good, <laughs> a good side effect. You mentioned, uh, Assertion versus argument. Now, I feel like most people probably know what those words mean on their own, but can we um, just briefly talk specifically about the difference between those two? Because I, I feel like this may be, at least in my view, this may be the, what comes up the most when somebody's making an assertion versus when somebody's making an argument and uh, how you react differently to each one of those things. What's, uh, what's the difference between those two things there? Well, an assertion is a claim, a truth claim that anybody can make based on an opinion only, 
They can make it any time about anything. It's like a blank palette. Mm. You can paint anything you want on it. A classic one might be, well, um, Christians throughout history have always killed lots of people. Oh, mm. wow. That's an assertion. Or the church is just trying to get your money so they can get rich. That's an assertion. So either one of those are not an argument. So we start asking questions. If somebody's in a conversation with me, they make either assertion like that. And that's where the um, how did you get there comes in, right? Yeah, I'm going to say, what do you mean by churches? When you say churches, which ones where? When you mean rich, what do you mean by rich? I mean, do you have a certain thing in mind? I mean, I'm going to ask three or four questions on either of those assertions. And I'll learn again right away, as we said, if they want to engage further or not. There are some assertion machines out there. Mm. People are just spitting them out all day long, and they really have no interest in meaningful dialogue about their assertions. And you know what? What a blessing it is to find out that you're dealing with one of them. Right. Because we don't have to deal just, with that in the same way, correct? No, no. It's a totally different approach. And and if someone's making an argument, as we, I think, have said before, it's not an argument in the classic sense of a conflict fighting. It means building a case. An attorney makes an argument based on evidence. So an argument's not an assertion. And you ask these questions and you'll learn quickly whether someone has an argument they're going to try to make or they've just tossed out assertions. Mm -hmm. And you can save yourself a lot of stress and trouble if you find out it's an assertion. Right. And Nothing you can do with that. And it seems like these conversations may start out with an assertion, but by asking the second little set of questions you had there, you're, you're really trying to get them to give you an argument from their assertion. Right. And you're seeing if they have one. Right. And, and, and it may just be more and more assertions that, that uh, never arrive to an argument. L let's go there. What, what happens when uh, you ask these questions, you dig deeper, what do you mean by that? How did you get there? And you just get more assertions. And maybe they're not quite... Um, they're not quite getting the cues that you're looking for an argument, or um, hopefully they're not, but maybe they're getting a little flustered. What's what's the what's the approach when you reach that uh, kind of that wall where you're not getting an argument despite how many questions you ask? Right, everything you say they just counter with another flurry of assertions. <laughs> yeah, you know, Kokel has a way that he recommends uh, to handle this, and it's similar to something I've done. For years, and, and I'll just give him the credit, though. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's called narrate it. You narrate it. So I'll describe back for them what they're doing and see if I have that right. I might say, so I just want to, can I point out something here? Sure, whatever. I've noticed that you've made several assertions, you've made several statements about things, and then I've asked questions uh, to see if we want to dig a little deeper, and you've just made more statements. So is that, are you thinking that's just how you want this to go? I just call it take the ball and give it back to them. Yep. I don't have to hold on to this. So is, is this kind of how you want it to go? Right. And So and that's a question they can't really respond to with another assertion, or if they do, it's absurd. And is there a danger to push the conversation past that? I mean, I, I feel like you're... You're, you're being clear, um, stopping the, that almost, that's either going to stop the conversation or they're really going to have to think about and maybe finally give you that argument that you're looking for. But right. uh, what, what's the value? And I think there really is a value in actually having the conversation end there because the next place it goes, if you don't have an argument, I, I imagine it's not a, a, a healthy dialogue at that point. Well, you imagine correctly, my friend, <laughs> you have a good imagination, because <laughs> it won't be. It'll get worse. It'll spin, and, and you'll feel worse, and the whole reason you got into the conversation could just fly out the window. Yeah, People could raise their voices. It could go into an argument in the classic conflict sense, and when that happens and the emotion comes in, all is lost for this type of engagement. 
So if someone, if I narrate it and feed it back to them and say, here's what I've observed and noticed, and then ask that last question. So is that what you're thinking you want this to be, or do you want it to go? Then I'll say, because if you do, hey, that's fine. I understand that, but but I'm not going to do it. Yep. Remember, the finger's always here. The finger's never there. It's always here. I don't say, you need to knock it off. You should look at why you're doing that. You should see what you're doing. You should admit what, forget all that. It's inflammatory and useless. And even if you think it, don't say it. <laughs> Point the finger back and go, it's not going to work for me. I, re- I really don't want to do that. I won't be doing that. Right. Easier said than and done. And then you say, you say maybe something for another day, but you don't, you don't uh, pull the pin on it and blow it up. Right. Yeah. All right, so we've arrived. Uh, they've they've made an argument. Uh, we maybe started an assertion, but we've asked some questions. We dug a little deeper. We've logged away the information. We've listened. We've we've really listened to them to really grasp um, what they're trying to say, not trying to misrepresent what they say, repeating it back to them. And they've given you some arguments at this point. Right. What's the third uh, uh, third step in this conversation at this point? What, what's the th- there's there's three kind of sub tactics within the Colombo tactics. So what's that third level? Well, that third level is important. And I gravitate to this. Um, One of the things we do is reverse the burden of proof. And we use questions to make our point to do that. So say, say someone has engaged and they're saying, okay, I'll tell you why. I believe there is no God because there's evil in the world. There's children in Africa in my own family, and they're building what they believe is a case. And they've cited five or six things that they would call exhibit A, exhibit B in the evidence. All right. And then I prayed for a job, didn't get it. We lost our house. So you're telling me God loves me. They believe they've made an argument. Mm. Okay. So I have to figure out a way to where they've made these assertions about there's no God because of these things. So what I'm going to do is flip it over. I still haven't said what I believe yet, but I'm going to ask questions about each thing. So for me, I might say, so in in your mind, these five things that you mentioned are evidence that God doesn't exist. Now, if any one of those came through and the other four didn't, would you still say he doesn't exist? If two out of the three went your way, would you still say God doesn't exist? Or would you need all five to go your way for you to believe maybe there's a God? Can you tell me how you see that? And then they might say, well, I think all five, I mean, because all five are worthy and reasonable. I might ask, so, and if more happens, because we all have lived long enough to know life can be tough, life can be cruel. So if five more things go wrong, that you think God, if he exists, ought to fix, would you say, again, you're not going to be favorable towards him until he fixes the next five? Mm. So by this time, they're going to sense what? Hey, you're making it sound absurd. Yep. And it's reductio ad absurdum. Reduce it to its absurd level. Why? Because, well, it's almost a different tactic. It's a combination. I want them to prove, they need to show why this is evidence Mm -hmm. to discount the existence of God, and they can't do that. Right. So in this case, I I would use reductio ad absurdum, and I would show them the absurdity of their comments by just asking question after question after question. Now, in its simplest form, reversing the burden of proof, Uh, Coco describes it nicely if you're in a classroom with a professor. And he goes, everybody knows the Bible's just a bunch of fables and myths. And and so that's an assertion. In that that case, you don't have to prove anything. So if you asked a question and said, can you tell me more about why you believe that? And the professor said, oh, you're one of those Christians that think thus and so. You would say... I haven't told you what I think. I'd like to know what you think. You're the one who made the claim. Mm. So that would be reversing the burden of proof. And when anyone makes an assertion or a statement, 
And I'm thinking, wait a minute. I'm not called on the carpet yet. I'm not up to bat. I don't have to do anything. They made it. I ask questions to give them the proof of confirming what they've asserted. Right. I and that's what the burden of proof is, correct? That's so what the burden of it's proof is. who's responsible for backing up the claim? Is It's the person exactly. who made the claim who's responsible. Right. And naturally, I feel like we, we dive into somebody says something that we disagree with and we naturally want to like, no, 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 that's not right. Uh, here's five reasons why. Yes. And uh, w- suddenly we've put the burden of proof on ourselves um, because we've heard, we've heard something that either upsets us yeah. or, or we just so disagree with and we have all this information about. Why is it important that we, that we do that, that we take a step back, even if we have 50 different points to make that we think are ironclad? Why is it important to let them have the burden of proof, to reverse that onto the person who's making the claim? Well, it's really important because of what you just said and for some other reasons as well. One, we're not trying to convince them in the moment. As Coco says, right out of the gate, and it's something that happened to me this morning. This happened to me this morning. I left the house at dark to run up Aguahito into the mountains. And it's my prayer time, and then it's my music time on the way down, worship music. And on the way down, I had to go through some brush because the, the road had black ice. Imagine that in Monterey. And when I come out of the brush, I had a rock in my shoe. It was a little tiny rock, but I knew I absolutely couldn't go any further. I had to stop, put my foot up on a rock, untie the shoe and get that rock out or, and get that little pebble out of my shoe, that stone. So that's, we have to remember our goal isn't to convert the person on the spot, have their entire ideology collapse in front of us and accept Jesus. And then we send them off, you know, to Bible class. We're gardeners not harvesters. Mm -hmm. Our goal is to put a stone in their shoe to make them begin to think different. So we reverse the burden of proof and it frees us up. See, if I think I have the burden of proof, I'll never see myself as adequate. How would I answer all the things that people can say out there? You'd have to be the world's greatest apologist slash debater slash toastmaster slash everything. Right. So, and you wouldn't use a tactic, you'd retreat, but I don't have to. I'm just asking more questions, asking more questions, especially not taking that burden on myself. It's really important to do that. So, and it surprises people and it surprises other Christians. Tell them, tell them all Jesus, why Jesus is the answer. I'll say, well, I don't know that's where we are in this conversation, my friend. (laughs) Yeah. See, here's, the, here's the, the ridiculous lengths this can go. And I've been in these conversations, sad to say, and witnessed many. Somebody makes an assertion. I get my oh, yeah on. Well, that's not it. The Bible says, you know, you got to look at your ways. You better get on your knees and you better repent, brother, because the scripture says. And that's where I'll go. Not every time, but there's danger of me yep. just starting lobbing, you know, rocks at them. Where are they going to, whoever came to the Lord through that? Right, right. So so I go back and say, well, you've made the assertion. All right, I want to hear more about it because you made this claim. I'm I'm wondering if they'll support it or not. You know, like the the roof and the walls, mm-hmm. right? The, 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 the claim is the roof, but the argument is the walls that support the claim. Right. And with an assertion, the roof's just sitting on the ground. It never gets off the ground. So they made it. We're going to see if they can put the walls underneath that roof. I don't have to do it. Indeed. So it makes it more relaxing for me to engage in these kinds of things. And and you'll notice, despite how much information you may or may not have. Now, now, uh, in the last episode that you and Cole talked about, you briefly mentioned that it's important to have information. We we sh- we want the knowledge. It's not like oh we don't even ha- we don't have to know anything about what we believe. We just ask right. questions all day. No 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 no. That's that's and I mean, it only it, goes so far. <laughs> but yeah. you'll notice so far in the tactics, we actually have just asked questions. Now I think the third sub tactic 
is where the knowledge starts to kick in because you actually need to know what uh, what is wrong with what they're saying to be able yeah. to ask the right questions there. But, um, well, this kind of leads into the next tactic, which we're going to talk about next week, uh, self-destructing uh, statements or, or, or however you put it. Uh, Kukul puts it in an interesting way. I'm sure we'll mention that. But uh, uh, I, I don't want to spoil it, so make sure to turn, tune in next week. We're going to continue this conversation. Dennis, thank you for enlightening us uh, and uh, just talking to us about uh, the Columbo tactic. Ah, always a pleasure. Thank you, Thomas. All right, well, we'll see you next week uh, with another tactic. Whether you're watching on our YouTube channel or listening on your podcast app, make sure to subscribe to hear more of our weekly episodes. Thanks for listening.